What's going on all of my healthcare brothers and sisters? I hope that you are having a wonderful day. We're continuing on with the ACLS mega code scenarios and we're gonna be looking at unstable bradycardia. Let's get started. So let's begin with our patient scenario. You are working on a cardiac progressive care unit. The bedside monitor alarms and you note that the patient is experiencing bradycardia. When you approach your patient, you see that they are clutching their chest and reaching out for help. When you look at your vital signs, the heart rate is going to be 35, blood pressure 90 over 50, respiratory rate 20, SpO2 97% on three liters nasal cannula, temperature a febrile, and they are 60 years of age. What is going to be your initial actions? So we're gonna begin with our ACLS assessment. Initially, we're going to be assessing for appropriateness for clinical condition. This means that the heart rate is typically gonna be less than 50 per minute to be considered a Brady arrhythmia. Next, we wanna identify and treat the underlying cause. We're gonna start by maintaining um, the patient's airway and assist with breathing if it is necessary. As we know, the patient is breathing on their own and they're breathing effectively. When it comes to oxygenation, we really want to be providing that if the SpO2 is less than 94%. The patient's already receiving oxygen, so if they needed a little bit additionally, we have a couple options. We can either turn up the oxygen on the flow meter, um, or let me rephrase that, we can turn up the flow on the flow meter, or we change the mass depending on um, what is best for the patient. Next, we want to look at the cardiac monitor to identify the rhythm as well as monitor blood pressure and oximetry. As we know, the patient is in a slow sinus bradycardia, and when it comes to our MAP, that's our mean arterial pressure, it's going to be 63 in this scenario, which is less than that 65 where we like it, so we know that there's some kind of decrease in perfusion taking place. We always want to make sure that we have IV access. In this situation, the patient does have a patent IV and starts reporting, um, reporting I'm sorry, extreme fatigue. Uh, next, we want to get a 12 lead ECG if it's available. If it's not available, we're not going to delay treatment based on trying to get a 12 lead ECG. And then lastly, we want to start considering possible hypoxic and toxicologic causes as a reason behind this sinus bradycardia. So next we wanna see if that persistent bradyarrhythmia is causing some other problems. So is the patient hypotensive? Well, yes, absolutely. Based on the uh, blood pressure that we get, they are hypertensive. Are they having acutely altered mental status? When you assess your patient, you're gonna note that the patient is alert and oriented times three. Is there any signs of shock? The patient states that his hands and feet are starting to feel very cold. When you feel his extremities, you're gonna note that they are cool to the touch. Why are the extremities start, suddenly starting to become cold? Well, as perfusion is decreasing and bradycardia is a limit the trajectory of circulating blood, the body begins to shunt the oxygen that it has readily available to those vital life-saving organs, such as our brain, our hearts, our lung, and our kidneys. This affects the perfusion to the extremities. So you're also gonna note that the patient's skin is going to start to look ashen. So yes, absolutely, in this patient scenario, the patient is exhibiting shock. Is the patient having ischemic chest discomfort? Absolutely. When you walked into that room, the patient was clutching their chest. So they are 100% experiencing that ischemic chest discomfort. And then lastly, is there any kind of acute heart failure taking place? Well, the patient doesn't have any history of it, but there could potentially be taking place. We're gonna need more data in order to make that determination. Based on everything that we're seeing, absolutely this patient is having um, very symptomatic bradycardia, so it is time to intervene. So what do our bradycardia interventions look like? Well, our first drug of choice is always going to be atropine. So based on the new 2020 AHA guidelines, our first dose is now gonna be one milligram bolus. We're gonna repeat every three to five minutes until we reach that maximum of three milligrams. We also can't consider transcutaneous pacing and or dopamine or epinephrine infusions. If we're going to be providing a dopamine IV infusion based on the new 2020 guidelines, we're going to start at five to 20 micrograms per kilogram per minute um, as an infusion rate. And then of course, we're going to titrate based on the patient's response as well as taper this medication down slowly. 
When it comes to our epinephrine IV infusion, that will be between two to 10 micrograms per minute. And again, we're titrating based on the patient's response. We also really want to get um, expert consultation in on this because we might have to consider some kind of transvenous pacing um, because transcutaneous pacing, as you know, is on the outside and it's pushing electricity in with these pads. That is extremely uncomfortable. You don't want to leave a patient on that for an extended period of time. So if those things aren't helping um, fix those bradycardias, then we might have to actually look at some kind of transvenous pacing. And then lastly, what were some potential causes for this bradycardia? Well, when we look at it and we think about it, myocardial ischemia as well as infarction could have potentially been taking place. Was there some kind of drug or tox um, toxicologic cause, such as calcium channel blockers, beta blockers, or digoxin? Sometimes patients overdose on those medications, and that absolutely could be a potential cause. Um, hypoxia couldn't be another potential cause for this patient, as well as electrolyte abnormalities, um, such as like hyperkalemia, absolutely can cause these unstable bradycardias. I hope that this video was helpful in understanding what to do in this ACLS mega code scenario. If you have any additional questions, make sure that you leave them down below. I love answering your questions. Make sure you follow me on my social media. I'm on Facebook as well as Instagram. If you're not already, subscribe here on YouTube and make sure you turn on that bell notification so you're notified every time I post a new video. If you haven't done so already, make sure that you check out my website at www.nursechung.com where there's additional resources on the ACLS algorithms as well as scenarios. But until next time, I hope that you're having a wonderful day and I will see you all again soon. Bye.